Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, welcome to the next lecture of fourth unit of plant biotechnology course. In this unit we are learning about the plant in microbial interactions, PGPRs that is the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, nitrogen fixation and uh, plant genetic engineering. My name is Manoj Sharma and I am working as an assistant professor of plant biology at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. In JNU, I teach plant biotechnology and genetic engineering courses at School of Biotechnology. And these lectures have been reviewed by Professor Kashmir Singh, who is working as a professor of biology at Department of Biotechnology, Punjab University, Chandigarh. And this project has been sponsored by DTH Swamprava MHRD, New Delhi. So in summary, in this lecture, we will continue talking about the PGPRs, that is plant growth promoting rhizobacteria that we started over in our last lecture. I will discuss about the various mechanisms, how the PGPRs work to stimulate the plant's growth in this lecture. Then I will also talk about the nitrogen fixation in a little more detail and uh, commercial considerations associated with the PGPRs. So before going ahead, a quick recap from the last lecture about the PGPRs. We talked about the diversity of the soil microbes in the plant microbial interactions. Then we discussed about various relationship types, that is the different level of intimacy among the plants and microbes and then also talked about the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria and their classification. We also learned about the various uh, regulatory signals of the plant and PGPR interactions like the root exudates which includes the organic compounds such as the sugars, amino acids, organic acids or the secondary metabolites proteins, polysaccharides, etc. that are synthesized in the plant and then these are secreted in the rhizosphere. PGPR synthesize phytohormones uh, that can manipulate the hormonal valence of the plants and affect the plant growth and development. And also uh, other regulatory signals or uh, PGPR synthesize other regulatory molecules like hydrogen cyanides or the lumichrome, etc., that affect either the plant growth or the proliferation of the other members in the rhizosphere. So, next is the mechanism of action of PGPRs. Now, there are several ways by which the PGPRs can affect the growth and development of the plants. Now, depending upon how they impact the plants, usually these are categorized into two categories, that is uh, direct plant growth promotion or indirect plant growth promotion. 
So the first one is the direct plant growth promotion. That means PGPR stimulate plant growth by synthesizing signal molecules or the other compounds that are utilized by the plants directly. These molecules or the resources can be grouped into two categories. The first category is the facilitating resource acquisition. That is, these PGPRs facilitate the availability of the nutrient resources like they fix the atmospheric nitrogen and make it available for the plants. Similarly, phosphate solubilization, production of the siderophores or the sequestration of the iron from the rhizosphere and so on. Second category is the modulation of the hormonal valence of the plants. So basically, PGPRs can synthesize all different kind of phytohormones and affect the plant growth and development. We had already learned about this topic in our last lecture under the molecules of plant microbe uh, interactions. And then the second type of mechanisms are indirect plant growth promotion. Now, PGPR synthesize certain compounds like antibiotics or uh, lytic enzymes that uh, do not directly impact the plant growth or development. But these may affect the activity of other members of the rhizosphere that ultimately can affect the plant growth and development. So basically, these regulate the plant growth and development indirectly. So the first category is uh, facilitating resource acquisition. Because of the continuous use of the soil for the commercial agriculture, they often get depleted for one or more essential nutrients. Now, some of the most common deficiencies are the availability of the fixed nitrogen or the iron or phosphate and so on. And therefore, the farmers often have to depend upon the chemical fertilizers to meet these deficiencies. However, the issue can be addressed through the biological means also, that is, the use of the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. The impact of the PGPRs on facilitating the acquisition of nutrients or the resources, other resources, is well studied. So the first is the nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen is a vital nutrient, that is, it is one of the most important nutrients that is essentially required for the biosynthesis of uh, molecules like amino acids or the nucleotides, which are the building blocks of the life. Its deficiency in the agriculture ecosystems compromises the plant growth, resulting in the severe losses in the crop yield. Though nitrogen is present in large amounts in the atmosphere, but it is not directly usable by plants. And therefore, in order to use it in the organic processes, molecular nitrogen needs to be fixed into biologically accessible forms. Therefore, bacteria that can change the unusable atmospheric nitrogen or molecular nitrogen to the plant usable form can play a critical role in agricultural productivity. There are three major ways through which the molecular nitrogen is fixed or changed to a plant usable form. These are number one is atmospheric nitrogen fixation. It results from the lightning discharge in the atmosphere. Then second is the industrial nitrogen fixation. 
it is done through the haber bosch process though the majority of the fixed nitrogen that is used in the agriculture systems is generated through the industrial fixation that is haber bosch process however it uses the fossil fuel derived energy and hence it would not be sustainable biological nitrogen fixation is mediated by diazotropic microorganisms using nitrogenase enzyme the microbes that can fix the molecular nitrogen and uh, can grow without any external source of the fixed nitrogen they are called as a diazotropes so the overall biological nitrogen fixation process uh, together with the subsequent assimilation of ammonia into the amino acids and other organic compounds it's a very or highly energy intensive process that is it consumes lots of lots of energy therefore the organisms involved in the nitrogen fixation should have an abundant supply of energy in the form of the atp molecules for the biological nitrogen fixation next is the nitrogenase enzyme that is a integral component of the biological nitrogen fixation so there are a group of uh, microbes that fix the atmospheric nitrogen to biologically active or biologically usable forms and for this purpose these microbes employ nitrogenase complex it is a metalloenzyme and there are three forms of this enzyme that is either molybdenum or vanadium containing protein and or uh, iron only nitrogenase however molybdenum containing nitrogenase or the protein is the best studied one these metal centers in the enzyme are necessary for the transfer of uh, electrons into the diatomic nitrogen nitrogenase complex is a special enzyme that has two major components the these are first dry di dinitrogenase and dinitrogenase reductase dinitrogenase that is a iron containing protein it receives the electrons from the central metabolism and second is a molybdenum iron containing component which is a heterotetramer that is the alpha 2 beta 2 type of uh, uh, oligomerization that is two units of alpha forms and uh, another two units of uh, beta forms are there it binds to the diatomic nitrogen and causes the reduction of the triple bond in the di nitrogen because the nitrogenase have several metal of centers many chaperones are required for its proper folding assembly and maintenance of its tertiary structure this nitrogenase enzyme and other regulatory component or proteins that are required for the biological nitrogen fixation or that are required for the maintenance of the tertiary structure of the nitrogenase complex are encoded by a cluster of conserved genes and this is called as a nif gene cluster these are named as nif with the capital alphabets like heteromeric dinitrogenase reductase is encoded by the nif d and uh, nif k and dimeric dinitrogenase is uh, encoded by nif h and similarly other genes are also named like nif with the capital alphabets nitrogenase enzyme is very sensitive to oxygen in fact it is inactivated within a few minutes of exposure to the oxygen the dinitrogenase reductase is inactivated within a minute as its uh, half life uh, is about 30 second and half life of the dinitrogenase is about 10 minutes so basically they are they are inactivated within a few minutes of uh, their exposure to the oxygen
and therefore maintenance of the anoxic conditions for the activity of the nitrogenase enzymes become mandatory so depending upon the type of interactions between the plants and the nitrogen fixing microbes these interaction can be categorized into two types first one is the non symbiotic association or the non symbiotic uh, microbes that make this kind of association and second is the symbiotic association or symbiotic microbes so the first one is uh, or the first category is the non symbiotic nitrogen fixation it is performed by free living soil bacteria or the diazotropes or the free living diazotropes these may be from the autotrophic or a heterotrophic type and they do not make any symbiotic relationship with the plants these microbes can fix the atmospheric nitrogen gas into more usable form that is the ammonia now diazotropic bacteria from at least 50 genera have been cultured successfully however it is just like a tip of the iceberg and their number is much more that is uh, there exists a great diversity of the microorganisms or free living uh, microbes that uh, are capable of fixing the nitrogen so there is a large or uh, huge diversity of uh, free living uh, diazotropes which uh, uh, have not been yet identified now based upon the physiology these organisms belongs to several different type of groups for example anaerobes now anaerobes they live in the habitats that are low in oxygen or in the absence of oxygen that is they don't like the oxygen like the clostridium species then the second category is the facultative uh, anaerobes so like some species of bacillus these can grow both with or without the oxygen so basically they can uh, adapt to both kind of conditions such as the presence or the absence of oxygen however they perform the nitrogen fixation activity only in the anaerobic conditions and then we have aerobes that is these require oxygen for the for their growth like the azotovector and then we have photosynthetic uh, uh, bacteria like the cyanobacteria and then in the photosynthetic bacteria also we have uh, the both types of uh, microbes that is uh, either the oxygenic or the uh, anoxygenic that is some of them may require the oxygen for their life whereas uh, another other microbes may need an oxygenic environment uh, for their growth so these have evolved under other type of mechanisms to create the oxygen free environment for the nitrogen fixation because for the nitrogen fixation nitrogenase has to be uh, present in the oxygen free environment free living diazotropes have been identified from several different habitats like they are present in the rhizosphere of the grasses or the cereal crops uh, these have also been found as a Uh, endophytes uh, in the cereal cereal crops that is they live inside the uh, tissues of uh, these plants they are commonly uh, associated with the decomposing plant residues in the soil or uh, the aggregates with the decomposable particulates organic matter for nitrogen fixation anoxic conditions are essential that is the absence of uh, oxygen earlier we we learned about how the nitrogenase is inactivated within a few minutes of its exposure to oxygen and therefore these free living bacteria uh, create uh, they have to create uh, an oxygenic uh, uh, environment for uh, the nitrogen fixation and they do it in different ways like some live only in the 
anaerobic condition that is the obligate uh, anaerobes while the others simply repress the nitrogenase synthesis when the oxygen is present in the surrounding so obviously they are the facultative anaerobes now many other aerobic bacteria follow other complicated processes to take care of uh, this problem like some perform rapid respiration to burn off the oxygen so basically they uncouple the electron transfer partially from the atp synthesis so that the oxygen is burned off as rapidly as it enters in the system and in this way they create the inoxygenic uh, environment or the oxygen free environment for the nitrogenase activity nitrogen fixation is a high energy requirement process and therefore for non symbiotic nitrogen fixation continuous availability of the carbon is required as an energy source now free living bacteria depends on the decomposing plant material for the carbon requirement so uh, they are uh, they usually grow or they are present in the organic rich uh, environments or the organic rich soils some examples of the non symbiotic fixers or non symbiotic nitrogen fixers are azospirillum azovector or cyanobacteria species like anamena or the nostoc etc second category is the symbiotic nitrogen fixation now this is performed by the bacteria that live in the symbiotic association or in symbiosis in the nodules and fix the nitrogen and most of the nitrogen fixed by the biological means is performed by the symbiotic nitrogen fixing bacteria these uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in the symbiotic relationship uh, they are like the rhizobium in the legumes they are live in the specialized structures that is the nodules as we discussed earlier in order to fix the atmospheric nitrogen bacteria need an anaerobic environment and abundant supply of the energy source the symbiotic environment of the nodule take care of both these requirements that is the energy as well as the oxygen liability of the nitrogenous complex so inside the nodule bacteria has access to the energy reservoirs of the plant in the form of carbohydrates synthesized in the plant so basically the plant synthesizes the carbohydrates and uh, other metabolic uh, intermediates and provide the energy for the bacteria to grow inside the nodules this help the bacteria to fix the nitrogen more efficiently as compared to the free living uh, bacteria as they have uh, excessive supply of uh, the carbon source in order to take care of the oxygen toxicity problem plant produces an oxygen binding hem protein that is like hemoglobin now this is a molecule analogous to the hemoglobin in animals that uh, transport the oxygen to respiring tissues in the animals now this like hemoglobin has a strong affinity for oxygen binding so it binds to all the available oxygens in the nodule and efficiently deliver the oxygen to the bacterial electron transport system because oxygen is uh, always bound to the leg hemoglobin and uh, hence free oxygen is not available in the nodule tissues and therefore oxygen cannot interfere with the nitrogen fixation process in the nodule so this is the this is the way how the plant creates the an oxygenic environment for the nitrogenase function and uh, provide excessive amount of uh, uh, carbon compounds or the metabolites for uh, uh, the energy supply now for the nodulation process the very first step is the identification of species compatible rhizobia that is the identification of 
species specific bacterial strain for the formation of symbiotic relationship. And in order to establish this relationship, bacteria need to move towards the roots as they are growing there in the soil and uh, they need to colonize the roots or uh, get attached to the uh, roots. So this occurs through the chemotaxis response. <laughs> here is a graphic uh, view of the root section with a root here. Uh, and uh, then here are all different kind of uh, bacteria present in the soil in the free living strait. Now, in order to attract the bacteria, plant releases secondary metabolites or the specific flavonoids in the rhizosphere which work as a signal for these uh, compatible uh, rhizobia or the free living uh, microbes uh, and they get attracted towards the, uh, towards the roots. So now the metabolites that are released in the rhizosphere uh, or in the surrounding these free living rhizobium in the soil, they recognizes these uh, molecules, uh, they are, which are released by the plant uh, roots, and uh, then they start migrating towards the root hairs uh, through a chemotaxis response or from where they, they are being released. After the chemotaxis migration, bacteria synthesizes now the nodulation factors. Uh, that are uh, also called as the NOD factors. So these NOD factors are basically lipocyte oligosaccharides, that is they are the glycolipids. And these bacterial NOD factors, they are released by the bacteria in the surrounding environment. These factors are recognized by the special receptors, that is the lactin receptors which are present on the membrane of the root hairs. Now, if they are not compatible, plant produces another lytic enzymes like the chitinases to digest the NOD factors from the incompatible species. After the confirmation that uh, these are the NOD factors uh, of the desired bacterium, NOD factors activate the lactin receptors which direct the rhizobia to anchor to the cell wall of the root here. Now the plant initiate, once the, once the, these rhizobia get attached to the cell wall, uh, they, the plant initiate the physiological responses associated with the nodulation process. And the very first step in this uh, process is the curling of the root hair to entrap the bacteria inside the curl. So the next step is the curling of the root hair to entrap the bacteria inside the curl. Uh, here the root hair tip grows and uh, it curls and entrap the rhizobium that were already there and get uh, that were already attached to the root hairs. Next change is the degradation of the cell wall in the region of where the rhizobia are entrapped that is in this particular region. If uh, uh, if we just see or uh, zoom in to this part, here in this region, cell wall will be degraded and uh, allow the bacteria with the direct access to the plant cell membrane. The plasma membrane of the root hair cells invaginates and form an infection thread. Now the bacteria enters the infection thread and so enter the root hairs. This event confirms the compatible interactions, that is the compatible rhizobia have been identified and been entrapped, and then it triggers the cell division in the cortical or the cambial cells in the root cortex. In this region, particularly the cell division is induced and uh, this initiate the nodule development. So this distinct area where this development starts is called as a nodule primordium that later develop into uh, full-fledged nodules. So bacteria enter the root hairs through the infection thread. While in the infection thread, bacteria keep on proliferating and infection thread filled with the proliferating rhizobia 
elongate through the root here towards the root primordium. Also, the cell division is initiated in the root primordium and the cells differentiate to form the root nodules. Finally, the infection thread reaches to the specialized cell of the nodule and uh, releases the bacteria in the host cells. For this purpose, the tip of the infection hyphae uh, fuses with the plasma membrane of the host cells and releases the bacteria in the host cells. Here you see in this particular cell, the branch of the infection hyphae is fused with the plasma membrane and have released the bacteria inside the cells. Inside the root nodule, the infection thread keep growing and branches, make several branches. And in this way, the infection is spread to many different cells in the nodules. After reaching in the host cell, these bacteria continue to divide for some time. And later, uh, they stop dividing, they begin to enlarge and differentiate into nitrogen fixing endosymbiotic organelle which are called as the bacterioids and now they are ready for the nitrogen fixation. Earlier I mentioned that this whole process of the nitrogen fixation is uh, energy intensive and uh, in this symbiotic relationship where these rhizobia fix the nitrogen for the plants plant provides ready-made energy sources in the form of carbohydrates or other metabolite intermediates for the growth of the bacteria. In order to run these exchanges smoothly, nodule develop a vascular system which facilitate the exchange of uh, fixed nitrogen produced by the bacteri bacteroids. Uh, with the energy or the nutrient sources contributed by the plant. And when infection occur only about 1.5% uh, or less than 2% of the root here get uh, or receive the infection. And uh, out of these here which get the infection, only about 20% they result in the formation of actual nodules. So next is the phosphate solubilization or the phosphate availability. Phosphates are present in insoluble form and are not usable by the plants. Therefore, despite large amount of phosphorus availability in the soil, plants are not benefited from it. It does not support the plant growth. Various phosphorus sources in the soil are rock phosphate, aluminum phosphate or the tricalcium phosphate, etc. Even the soluble inorganic phosphate that is applied as a chemical fertilizer is immobilized soon after the application and it becomes unavailable to the plants after some time. Plant uses phosphates in mono or dibasic forms, uh, which are soluble forms. This solubilization of the inorganic phosphates uh, results from the action of uh, several low molecular weight organic acids like the citric acid. PGPR help in mineralization and uh, solubilization of the inorganic phosphorus and transform it into a usable form that can be utilized by the plants. These PGPRs utilizes the sugars which are excreted in the root exudates from the plants and they produce organic acids like the citric acid or the gluconic acid and these uh, acids they help in the solubilization of the inorganic phosphorus and make it available for the plant in the soluble form. C 
Similarly, PGPRs synthesize variety of enzymes like the phytases or the phosphatases, uh, which uh, catalyzes the hydrolysis of uh, phosphoric esters and result in the mineralization of the organic phosphorus and make it usable by the plants. Next category is the phytohormone production. Now, in the last lecture, we had learned about the PGPR produced phytohormones as the signal molecules and their impact on the plant growth. That is how the, these uh, phytohormones are synthesized by the PGPRs and uh, they are taken up by the plant and uh, uh, manipulate the plant metabolism. So the PGPR synthesizes various hormones like uh, they can synthesize auxin, cytokinin, gibberellins, and uh, they manipulate the hormonal valence of the plants. So basically, PGPR synthesizes these phytohormones and uh, raises in the uh, rhizosphere, maybe in the ectorhizosphere or in the endorhizosphere, and then these are taken up by the plants uh, from the rhizosphere, and hence they stimulate the plant growth and enhances the yield. PGPR produced auxins, specifically the indole 3 acetic acid, uh, they are well studied for their impact on the plant growth. Auxins uh, stimulate the root branching and induce the elongation of the roots too, thereby resulting in the increase in overall root biomass. Further, they may regulate the size of the stomata as well as their density. So in totality, PGPR induced IAA, that is indole 3 acetic acid or other auxin, they increases the root length and the overall root surface area. Therefore, it provides the plants a greater access to the soil nutrients and hence help in uh, better growth of the plant. Similarly, PGPR can produce other hormones too, like the cytokinin, gibberellins, abscisic acid, uh, and these can regulate the plant growth and development. However, very little data is available for these hormones till now. Overall, the impact of the PGPR produced phytohormones depends upon the endogenous level of uh, these hormones in the plants too, because these phytohormones are produced by the plants also and uh, their concentration may vary from uh, one tissue to different types of tissues or different species and hence uh, the endogenous uh, uh, level of the phytohormones or their interaction with the exogenous uh, phytohormones which are produced by the, the PGPR, they regulate the overall impact on the plant growth. Next is the siderophores. Now, siderophores are the low molecular weight compounds that work as a high affinity iron chelators. So basically, these compounds, when present in the rhizosphere, they work as a iron chelator. That is, they, they sequester the, or they absorb the available iron in the rhizosphere and release it as per the requirement of the plant. Now, how does it help the plant? So basically, it uh, reduces the availability of the iron for the growth of the pathogens in the rhizosphere. When all the iron is absorbed by the siderophores, iron will not be available in the rhizosphere and hence the pathogen will not be able to grow. However, it will be released slowly for the plant's growth and therefore plant will not suffer from the chelation of the iron because of the siderophores. Pseudovactin, which is uh, produced by Pseudomonas fluorescens, is in another example of the siderophore. It is a yellow-green fluorescent siderophore that work against the plant pathogen Arbenia caratovora. So basically, pseudobactin producing PGPRs can be used to control the plant pathogen Arbenia caratovora. 
Similarly, hydrocyanic acid in the rhizosphere reduces the overall crop yield in the potato. For the production of hydrocyanic acid, iron is required, that is, it is essential. However, in the presence of the PGPRs that uh, chelate the iron, they make it unavailable for the HCN production. Therefore, it uh, reduces the production of HCN and uh, improves the potato crop yield. So the next is the indirect mechanisms. Now, there are several ways when the PGPRs are not directly involved in stimulating the plant growth. Uh, however, it, they influence or alter the other components of the system and result in the stimulation of the plant growth or affect the plant growth. Like the first one is the synthesis of the lytic enzymes. Now, PGPR synthesizes uh, cell wall degrading enzymes like uh, uh, chitinases, cellulases, proteases, or uh, glucanases, and so on. Now, these enzymes can directly control the fungal pathogens by inhibiting their hyphal growth. So, basically, these uh, enzymes can lyse the cell wall of the fungal pathogens and hence inhibit their growth. In fact, PGPR have been found to have biocontrol activity against Botrytis cinerea, Fusarium oxysporum, or Phytophthora species, etc. So these are the fungal pathogens which are commonly common in the plants, and uh, PGPR having the biocontrol activity against these fungal pathogens have been identified. Next category is the antibiotic production. Now, PGPR bacteria produces range of uh, metabolites that have uh, antimicrobial activities and uh, can be used to inhibit the growth of uh, deleterious microbes or the pathogens in the plants. Few examples of such antibiotics or the metabolites are uh, like the agrosin 84, uh, phenengenes, pyolutin, Teorin or fluoroglucinol, etc. So, usually these are associated with preventing the uh, proliferation of the fungal pathogens of the plant. However, among these examples, agrosin 84 is an antibacterial and others have uh, antifungal activity. In fact, based upon the type of uh, antibiotics formed by bacteria, some biocontrol strains have been commercialized too, like the Vacillus lichenni formis SV3086. It is a commercial biofungicide and uh, it is commonly used uh, as a biocontrol agent. Another feature that can be used in combination with the antibiotics is the Synthesis of HCN or hydrogen cyanide, it gives better results. So, in addition, because of the too much use of the antibiotics, it can result in the development of the resistance in the in these phytopathogens against which these antibiotic uh, uh, related PGPRs are used. And therefore, use of HCN synthesis trait along with the antibiotic production it can be very helpful to address the problem of the antibiotic resistance. Next is the induced systemic resistance, that is uh, ISR. Now, PGPRs can trigger the induced systemic resistance in the plants. So, basically, ISR is uh, similar to the systemic acquired resistance, which is uh, usually activated in response to the infection by a pathogen. Induced systemic resistance do not target to any specific pathogen, but it increases the overall basal resistance level towards several pathogens simultaneously. Plants induced for the systemic resistance are called as primed, 
and these prime plants they respond faster and more strongly to the pathogen infection as compared to the plants without any induction of uh, systemic resistance so isr does not require any direct interaction between the resistance uh, inducing PGPR and the pathogen or rather plants with the ISR they can perform better in response to several different kind of uh, uh, pathogen infections. Next category is the ethylene production. Now plants synthesizes ethylene during the infection of uh, uh, phytopathogens that is ethylene produced because of the stress and this results in the acceleration of the stress effects on the plants and it causes the more damage to the plant so basically ethylene accelerate the damage caused by the by the phytopathogen infection therefore reduction in the ethylene production can help to uh, to protect the plant from this uh, acceleration in the damage and uh, PGPR producing ACC deaminase can be used for this purpose. So ACC deaminase we also studied earlier that uh, it uh, reduces or it inhibits the ethylene production and hence it reduces the overall damage caused by a wide range of pathogens. Further, it has been observed that uh, the competitions among the pathogens and the non-pathogen PGPRs can limit the disease incidence rate. Though it is very difficult to demonstrate these kind of uh, facts, however, more and more uh, evidences are being accumulated and which, uh, which direct that, uh, yes, the competition between pathogen and non-pathogen uh, PGPRs can uh, help to control the uh, level of uh, disease uh, incidence. So now a few quick facts about the mechanism of action of uh, PGPRs. So there are several different types of mechanisms through which PGPRs can act and therefore all the PGPRs do not utilize the same type of mechanism. A particular PGPR or plant growth promoting bacterial strain uh, will always follow only one type of mechanism all the time is not true. Hence, they may act through any one or more than uh, one type of mechanism of actions. They may follow different type of mechanisms at the different conditions. So basically uh, there is no universal phenomena that uh, this bacterium is going to act in this way all the times in all the environmental conditions. They may change, they may follow more than one type of uh, uh, mechanism or actions as per uh, the requirement of the conditions. Further these microbes can follow any one type of the both that is the direct as well as the indirect uh, mechanism of action. So basically in the direct mechanism they can directly impact the plant growth or uh, otherwise they may impact the other component in the rhizosphere that is uh, they may regulate the growth of the other uh, bacterial species in the rhizosphere that impact the plant growth and development. Different species uh, of the same genus of the PGPR or even the different strains of the same species may have very different activities and uh, may follow totally different types of uh, pathways. So bacteria from the, or the species from the same genus, they have evolved different type of uh, uh, mechanism of actions through which they interact with the plants and they affect the plant growth and development. One particular PGPR strain can uh, have very different type of uh, growth responses in different plant species. 
it reflects the physiological or the biochemical status of the different plant species. So it's not that uh, these differences are recorded in different species that is the phylogenetically distinct plants but uh, uh, even different genotypes of the same species can uh, behave differently too. So there is a lots of lots of diversity uh, from both the perspectives. The physiology of the plants changes with the age of the plants as well as with the change in environmental conditions in which the plants are growing. And therefore, even the same genotype may respond differently to the same strain of the uh, PGPR at uh, the different time points during its life cycle. These differences are because of the change of the physiology of the plant with the age, that is the metabolic composition of the tissues or the metabolic composition of the root exudates uh, may change with the growth stage of the plants like young seedling versus the adult plants or actively growing adult plant versus the plants under the senescence. So they, they would have a variation in the, their root exudates and in this way the interaction with the PGPRs or uh, bacteria in the rhizosphere it also differs during the different stages of development. So these may result from the change in the environmental conditions also like the change in the temperature or the soil composition or the presence or the absence of the stressful compounds or the phytopathogens. So anything which affect the physiology of the plants or the biochemical status of the plants that can impact the how the plant is interacting with the microbes or what kind of microbes will in, uh, interact with the plant during those conditions. So in order to develop the PGPRs for the commercial applications, what are the important features or the checklists that should be considered. So the first one is the selection of the appropriate biological activity. So it is one of the very important or the foremost uh, to understand what are the appropriate biological mechanisms or the activities that should be uh, followed to promote the crop productivity. Like is there any nutrient deficiency where we want to use the uh, microbes like the nitrogen deficiency or the phosphorus deficiency or if the requirement is to induce the defense responses or to induce the systemic response in the plant for the uh, protection from the phytopathogens and so on. So it's very important uh, to select the appropriate biological activity. Second is the choosing the type of the microbe. Now, there are options to choose from among the endophytic type or the ones which are free living in the active rhizosphere. So, depending upon the what kind of activity is uh, required and what will be the suitable type for that activity, endophytic or the free living microbe uh, can be chosen. Now, it's very important that the selected strains of PGPRs are easy to handle like these are easy to prepare or store or to transport to other regions. Now if think that if the strains are sensitive and if they require special expensive media to grow or the costly equipment or the maintenance of the conditions to grow them or if these strains need special conditions for their storage or the transport it, it would increase the cost uh, of the production of these strains and uh, their maintenance. And uh, hence, they will not be sustainable or viable commercially. So it's very important that uh, they should be easy to handle like uh, preparation, storage and transport. These strains should be extremely stable. That is, it should not lose its biological activity during various operations like uh, its storage for a longer time or uh, transport uh, or during the transport from one place to the another place. Further, it should be non-pathogenic to the animals or uh, as well as the humans too.
bacterial strains uh, should be optimized for the local conditions now change in the environmental conditions uh, where they will be used it can affect the genetic stability or the biological activity of the strains and so therefore region specific optimization of the strain would be required and it's very important to have a commercial success further they should be compatible with the chemical additives now many time seeds are coated with some chemicals or chemicals are applied during the different stages of uh, development of the crops like in fertilizers or uh, as a uh, protectants or the defense from the pathogens and the type and the concentration of these chemicals used may vary significantly among different crops and hence these should be compatible with the chemical used for that particular crop then for the large scale applications in the field required technology should be available like when we have to inoculate uh, in the large scale uh, commercial productions necessary plant inoculation methods or the procedure should have been optimized and finally whether to use genetic modifications or not should be considered carefully and one should consider to protect the strains to the uh, the patenting regimes too whether to patent or not to to protect the intellectual property now like there are evidences that the genetically engineered strains are robust and uh, they perform much better and uh, so they can be used and obviously their performance will be better in the commercial applications too however there are issues with the, their acceptability uh, with the regulatory agencies and uh, and hence should be considered carefully so in summary we discussed about the various mechanisms uh, that uh, plant growth promoting uh, rhizobacteria they used to work or they used to make an impact on the plant we talked about the various direct mechanisms when the uh, pgpr directly impact the plant or indirect mechanism of uh, actions too so under the direct mechanisms we learned about the nitrogen fixation where we talked about uh, non symbiotic uh, as well as the symbiotic type of uh, nitrogen fixation we talked about the phosphate solubility siderophore production or the phytohormone production and under indirect pathways we learned about the production of lytic enzymes or the antibiotics induction of the systemic resistance in the plants and so on and finally we talked about the important characteristics of the pgprs that should be considered uh, while developing the uh, the commercial strains for the pgprs thank you